Mr. Pond Boss, tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Bob the Lust coming at you live from Rudoso, New Mexico. I've been here about, oh, I don't know, a little over a week, and it sure is fun. I'm getting to uh, actually get a whole lot of things done. I've been wanting to do some things for a long, long time, and actually, I just got to finishing a, a book. And like I told you all last week, I've got that thing in the can. I don't have a name for it yet, so <laughs> we're trying to figure out a good name for it. Hey, I see Steve Scanlon, Gregory Roark, John Funk. John, I got your email today. Your uh, name nomination will go in the hat. I've got kind of like a committee working with it, with me on it to see what we can come up with. Jeremy Duckworth, Kim Moore. Good to see Kim. You guys know the drill. Hashtag Palm Balls Magazine. Click like. Share this to your timeline and tag a friend. You'll be eligible for a drawing, which we'll do pretty quick for a Palm Balls hat. There it is, live and in color. And a Pond Boss mug. Say it with me. I see Wayne checking in. Kenny Sanderson. And knows how to keep hot things hot. Cold things cold. Now, we don't know how it knows, but it knows. So, good to see everybody. we got a pretty good crowd cranking up. Charlie Kaplinger. Looky there. There's uh, Jennifer Ardoin. Her husband's been texting me back and forth. He's over in Louisiana looking at a lake site where some folks have cleared some land, getting ready to do some some uh, lake building over there. I see Drew Bachman checking in from South Carolina. Drew, uh, and I will tell everybody, I'm trying to put together a uh, a road trip. Hey, Danny Mack, good to see you, buddy. So uh, I'm thinking about going, maybe starting in Louisiana, go to make a stop in Mississippi, uh, go see my grandkids in Alabama, and maybe pop in to see American Sport Fish Hatchery and then head to the Carolinas. Uh, so I'm looking for some places to go, people to talk to, and just see where we can go with that. There's Jeremy Duckworth. Good to see Jeremy. So anyway, um, spread the word. I'm, I'm going to do a road trip. I'm probably going to end up in the Carolinas. I was thinking about going north, but I haven't thought about that yet. Um, uh, go to Kingfisher Society. Maybe check in with Mike Cook with the Boy Scouts there in central um, North Carolina. And then after that, I don't know where I'm going to go. I may go west, go through Tennessee, try to hunt down some people there. Maybe... Maybe like Michael Gray, he checks in here quite a bit. And uh, sure, hey Mike Cottrell, there is it's it, it is cool here. <laughs> it's probably in the low 60s right this minute. Feels really good. I'm gonna kind of hate to leave here, but by the time I go, I will have been here 12 days waiting on the Queen to get the house, get her palace finished. We've uh we bought a house back in I think got it closed on it in June, and doing some. I'm glad they're not even massive renovations, but. It's taking a massive amount of time, but she's getting to it. Drew, I'll holler at you and see what we can figure out. Jeremy Duckworth, got it right. Doug Cusick, Ty Jackson, come to Florida. I have a cool A-frame cabin you can stay at. That's kind of interesting. John Krause, you know what? I'm, I'm going to check out the Cardinals here in just a little bit, too. I love baseball. I watched that game last night, and good gosh, it was so much fun. I love baseball. You know what I love about baseball? You know, football, it's 11 on 11. And brute force and finesse, quickness, speed, of violent hits, which I don't know that I like that that much, but it's okay. Uh, basketball, five on five. But baseball, it's nine against one. They're throwing a five-ounce sphere, and somebody's trying to hit it with a stick, while nine people are trying to keep him from hitting it. Nine people are trying to keep him from touching four points before they get a run, get a point. And that's pretty cool. It's like chess to me. So I love watching that. <clears throat> I thought about tonight, I thought I might tell a few stories, and I'd really like to tackle some of your questions and see what you got going and see what we can do to help a few folks tonight. Looks like our crowd's a little bit thinner, probably because of baseball. Heck, I don't blame people. I'd be watching baseball, too, if I wasn't doing this. But let's do it. Let's go. So what, um, Ty, let's, uh, why don't you message me? And tell me what part of Florida you're in, and we might see if we can pull that off. I don't know. We, we can sure try it and see. Um, I thought I'd talk about one of, the, one of the things really, and I've talked about this a little bit, that's very, very important to me that as I get older, that I'm starting to see how things tie together. I mean, like, look over my shoulder. <clears throat> I'm in the mountains at uh, elevation of 6,900 feet in Ruidoso, New Mexico. And as I look around, I see pine trees and I see spruce trees and juniper-type trees. 
uh, every day I, I hear the, um, I guess I'm, I'm kind of calling a cackle of ravens. You know, if, if, if I hadn't been here before and looked at that, I would think they're crows, but they're way too big to be crows. You know, I've seen a herd of elk walking through town two times. You know, just, I saw a herd of elk today just over in a, in a neighborhood just pulling berries off of trees and grazing and trying to build up their body fat for the winter, you know, before it gets cold. And all those things don't just happen. They don't. And it's the same thing with your pond as you start thinking about it. When you start thinking about, let's see, Dave Weber baseball, the only game with a ball in which the defense has the ball. You know, that is kind of awkward. I love that. I absolutely love that. That's, and you're right. The defense has the ball. Yep. And one person is trying to hit it. So where I was going to go with the, with my story is, is if you can look around you and appreciate what you see and then start thinking about how all that comes together, you know, it's not just by happenstance. The kinds of grasses that grow here will not grow in Mike Cottrell's yard in Palapena County, Texas. Ain't going to happen. It would burn to a crisp. So where we live, what we do is influenced by our environment and our surroundings and our habitat. And the same thing holds true in nature. As goes that habitat, so goes what lives in it. And it's when you start thinking about it like that collectively, I see Steve Scanlon checking in again, Bob Mayer, Wyatt's checking in from Denver, Colorado. Looks like some people are getting kicked off coming back. Andrew Hernandez, Sam Rodriguez from Atoka, Oklahoma. Sam, I may be coming through Oklahoma on Monday. No, not Monday, but on Tuesday. So uh, I'll, uh, if, if you don't hear from me by about, oh, say, 10 o'clock Monday morning, give me a call on my cell phone. I might be able to swing by and take a look at what you got going on my way back to Grayson County on, on Tuesday. Let's see here. What else we got? Brian Baker from Miami, Oklahoma. <clears throat> I love Miami, Oklahoma. When I'm traveling to Missouri, that's usually where I stay the night at the Holiday Inn Express. Mark Hicks is checking in. Good to see everybody. Tom Davis, I see Tom. So the way I want you to think about your pond or your lake is is you one, one of the cool things that we have by having a dominance over our 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 inheritance over our um oh hell i can't think of the word i want to use over our property it's our domain and we're able to to care for it and stewardship is a big 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 concept for me hi clayton bounds good to see you um and the uh the way i want you to approach it is is you know your goals pretty much and if you don't you need to Drill down and figure out what your goals are. For example, uh, um, I'm working with a guy in northeastern Missouri. He's going to build a. He's in the middle of building about a five acre lake. And I sat down and asked his goals, and he he was pretty clear cut. He said, "I want a place where we I can put up some campsites and glamping for my wife and for my kids and for my grandkids, for my clients and my friends." So what he's trying to do is create a social gathering point where people can come and enjoy the lake. So that was his number one goal. The second goal he's got is he's thinking that he wants to have a really good fishery and he doesn't really know his options. So he's thinking, he, he thinks he knows he wants largemouth bass, bluegill. You know, he said, can I have copper nose bluegill? Mm, no, not there. It's a little bit out of their zone. You know, if you took, if you took copper nose bluegill and stocked them in northeastern Missouri, they wouldn't make it through the winter. They'd be shivering by November. <laughs> so talking to him, hello, Byron Kazar, good to see you. I know where Marlowe, Oklahoma is. I'll be running pretty darn close to Marlowe, Oklahoma on uh, Tuesday morning. I'm going to spend the night in Childress and then go up somewhere in north central Oklahoma once I get the pin. So hello, Travis, good to see you, buddy. Um, so now, uh, anyway, so his goals are, to have a beautiful site, low maintenance, can grow reasonable fish with a legitimate chance at catching a pretty good fish. 
Stephen Martin, Rose Hill, Kansas. Holy cow, everybody's checking in tonight. That's great. Glad to see you, folks. Doug Cusick, good to see you, Doug. Um, and so as I've talked to him, one thing I said, okay, once we know what the, what the fish are that you want, then we need to go through the steps. And I've, I preach this almost every time I do the show. You got five real basic fundamentals. You got to have happy water, habitat, a food chain. What's the third one? Say it. Genetics. You don't need Florida genetics in northeastern uh, Missouri. And then a harvest plant. Pond or lake is like a garden. At some point, you got to take something out of it. And that, that's where most people fall short because they just don't know what they don't know. So uh, let's see. Mark Hicks. See you. Good to see you, buddy. So, um, uh, and so what, what, the, the way I'd like for you to think about this, if you've got an existing pond or if you're going to build one or if you want to rehab one, if you're going to rehab one, you, we, we need to talk. Uh, read the, if, if you haven't subscribed to Pond Boss yet, do that. 35 bucks. 35 bucks a year. And I say this every show. 35 bucks cheaper than a Friday night date and it lasts a year. That Friday night dates over Friday night, and you've forgotten about it by Saturday afternoon when you're watching college football tomorrow, or I mean on Saturday. So, uh, and it's full of nuggets. In the next issue, I've got one of the probably one, I'm, I'm going to consider it one of the most important articles I've ever written about renovating ponds and lakes because there's so many unknowns and it can get out of hand so fast. I've, I've worked with one guy recently where the money that he ended up spending on renovating his pond. He could have built two new ponds somewhere else on the ranch. But he didn't know that, and by the time he was about a third of the way into it, he felt like he was committed to it and he wasn't going to walk away from it. So by the time he got, got to the finish line, he'd spent enough money to build two ponds, probably bigger, in the same watershed on the same ranch, and he could have bulldozed that one in and made it a swale, you know, or, or one that can continue to just gather silt. So... Travis is saying, how's the family and the new... I haven't seen the newest little Lusk, but she just turned two months old and rolled over. And I think that's ahead of schedule. I don't know. She's going to give those two big brothers she's got a run for their money when she's bigger. She'll probably be walking by the time she's 10 months or a year. Um, I'm going to circle back and see them in a couple of weeks, I think, just before I hit this road trip going to the east. Uh, but where where I'm going is 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 when you when you look at your surroundings, like I'm looking at here, this stuff, as a as a biologist with 40-plus years under my belt, it makes sense to me. The kind of dirt, which is mostly rocky, uh, gritty, a little bit of topsoil. The majority of the dirt here comes from the needles falling off the pine trees, mulching into the existing soil to continue to feed the soil. You know, so there's an ecosystem right there. I mean, there's an ecosystem underneath each one of these pine trees I'm looking at. And that ecosystem is the needles fall, rain comes, breaks them down, microbial action, insects chew them up, worms, whatever whatever they've got here, and it composts that stuff and helps rebuild the soil in the forest floor, which helps continue to keep the trees growing. So all these different factors are coming together, and I want you to think about that when you're when you're talking about uh, or thinking about your pond, because you've got that environment, you've got what's at the water line and below. So if you've got the right, if you've got happy water and if you've got the right kind of habitat to support all the different sizes of the different species of fish that you've got in there, you're going to create a good food chain, which is going to create a good fishery or a healthy fishing lake. Now, one of the things we, we were taught as young biologists is, is to seek balance Stock that pond and seek balance. Well, I'm going to tell you, like I've said before, those of you that have seen this show, you know what I'm going to say next. You don't ever achieve balance. It's a teeter-totter. You know, you got that teeter-totter going like that. This, You get too many rabbits here, then you start getting coyotes. And then you get too many coyotes, and then coyotes disappear. And then the rabbits come back. Same thing happens underwater because it's a fish-eat-fish fish world under there because you're managing predators and prey. Now, this guy in northeastern Missouri that I'm talking about, he says, can I have walleye? I said, you know what? I think you can have walleye here. Your, your, your depth is going to be okay. Now, if you want to do walleye, you need to create some walleye habitat. Well, what's that? 
Well, you need some rock piles and you need some areas that where you got rocks and fairly shallow water with quick access to deep water. And then if you've got a couple of coves where they can come in because they like to come in in the afternoon and at night sometimes to feed, you know, they'll come up shallow and feed. So, and he said, what about smallmouth bass? And I said, no, walleye aren't going to reproduce in this pond. Not going to happen. What about smallmouth? Well, you can have smallmouth, but they're going to compete intensely with the largemouth, and the largemouth will absolutely outcompete them bar none. Now, the smallmouth, if you create some smallmouth spawning beds, they can spawn there, but that doesn't mean the survival rate's going to be good. You know, but with the largemouth bass, they're going to spawn like crazy. So are the bluegills in northeast Missouri. I know he'll get two spawns of bluegill, probably three each year. So, uh, so what we do is we, we've created underwater shelves where the, we got three to one slopes going down to a shelf that's about as wide as a pickup truck and at least as long as a picked up pickup truck. I think he's going to create a shelf that goes all the way around two points that they're creating. So when you do that, and if you can create that habitat, then your success rate is going to go up. And think of it just like where you live. You know, you live in a home. You got a travel path to get you to and from where you need to go. There's schools, there's restaurants, cafeterias, there's places to go for entertainment, green belts, the parks, places for people to gather, churches. You know, you need those elements underwater for all these fish. And if you don't, then you're going to get what is would be would thrive in the environment that you create. So if you got happy water and great habitat, then you're going to be able to build a food chain and help keep it closer to balance because you're protecting some of those bait fish enough of the big ones that they can survive. So there's a lot of things that kind of come together there to create an underwater community. And it's and, and, and the way I want you to think about it is think about how it all ties together. Just like I just told you about these pine trees I'm looking at. They create their own nutrients on, on the ground by having their needle shed. And, and, and the same thing happens over there where uh, uh, over at Kingfisher Society in, in North Carolina. They've got longleaf pine trees all around there. Now, what the pine trees do for the lake is they create acid water. Hmm. So if I had to check, if I check the pH around here of these rivers and streams, I bet you that pH is pretty low because there's not a lot of minerals that dissolve into the water. That's the kind of stuff that you need to know when you're working with your pond. So I see some uh, questions popping up. Let's take a minute. Travis wants to have a conversation here. He's saying, what have you been doing there the last week? Beautiful place. I'm, it is a beautiful place I'm, I am. Uh, what I've been doing the last week is I have finished my book, finished the November, December issue of Palm Boss, which didn't take a lot. That took about, oh, half a day. I got the book finished. I had already gotten all the words written. I needed to pick out pictures, write captions. So I went through 6,500 photographs, labeled them, uh, categorized them, and I picked about 100 of those to go into the book. And so that was has been mainly my focus. And then one day I just rested. And then uh, on uh, uh, Sunday, uh, Saturday and Sunday, I watched football the whole time while I was picking out pictures. So uh, I got to watch several of my teams, which I never do that. I don't ever, I don't ever perch in front of TV and watch anything. And I've actually read a book, which I don't do that either. Been doing a Bible study every day, which that's that helps keep me grounded. Although this has been a grounding good 10 days or so, so far. Uh, but that uh, Catmandu, Ken... Ken Grimala tells me that my haircut and my beard trim make me look much younger. Well, thanks, buddy. I hope things are well with you and your things are working out good over in, I think you're in North Carolina now. You moved from West Virginia. Great. Thank you for that compliment. Um, let's see here. I want to go back just a little bit here. Danny Mac, so we want to harvest bluegills, but they act like worms is trash. Give me pellets. Third day, no food. They fight to take a one-inch pellet. Are they hungry? They could be the catfish ways. You bet they're hungry. If you cut their food off, it takes about eight hours in warm temperatures for a bluegill to digest its food. You know, so if it packs its little tummy full of fish food at the feeder, it only takes it eight to ten, depending on how much it eats, it takes eight to ten hours and that stuff's gone. And if it's not plucking worms or bugs or crustaceans or whatever it can eat off the pond bottom and off the plants and the and in case in your case, rocks and liner then uh, they're going to be hungry. So when they get hungry, it'd be kind of like 
when I was a teenager, when you were a teenager, you'd go to the refrigerator and you'd open it up. If there was some meat, boy, you'd roll it up and eat it. If there wasn't, eh, you might eat cereal, you know, or a bowl of soup or holy cow, broccoli. What? You know, bluegill are, are, are meat eaters and they're not going to be as, as uh, the big word is omnivorous as like a channel catfish will. So they'll let their tummy go empty and then peck around, see what they can get. If they can't get what they want, they'll lose weight. I mean, I've, I've in my electric fishing boat, I've come across bluegill that you could almost read through. They were so thin. You know, in, the, in order to get to that size, 9, 10, 11 inches long, they had to have weighed way more than they did when I, when I was looking at them. And that is that is just simply a lack of food. So uh, they'll, they'll deteriorate and end up starving to death if they don't get it. But, 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 yes, to answer your question, yeah, they were hungry. Mike McPherson, last Sunday had bass that were stocked this spring chasing baby tilapia in the shallows. Very exciting for a year-old pond. And I'll tell you something else about that. You're going to be stunned, Mike, at how fast those fish grow. You know, when you when you stock those bass, I'm going to guess they were probably 2-inch fingerlings, 3-inch fingerlings. Those things, by I'm going to tell you, by the end of this month, will be 10 inches long. There might be a handful of them that are 12 inches long, the fast growing. Now, that's if you've created the right food chain because you have happy water, great habitat. When all those things tie together, it's stunning how fast some of these fish can grow. Kenny Sanderson, if you have time, can you discuss reproduction versus recruitment? I believe this is confusing to some. Heck, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that is, uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's hit that. That is that. Let's do that. Um, reproduction. Let me give you this clue here. Let's take a uh, let's take an eight pound largemouth bass. She is likely to spawn two hundred thousand eggs. So out of those eggs, how many of them are going to hatch? Let's say that she's had a great year and eighty percent of them hatch. Well, now you got somewhere to the tune of two hundred thousand babies. How many of those are going to make it? Well, the goal in nature, when, when adults reproduce, you know, out of here around these trees or in your pond, nature's goal is to replace the parents. So what that means is a very low percentage of those fish are going to survive. Now, when those thousands and thousands of baby bass are hatched, there's going to be a certain percentage of them that are aggressive. And they're going to be the ones, and in, 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 in the way I, the, the term that biologists use is plasticity. So if we were to take those bass babies, and I've explained this before, I think, on the show, and we put them in that environment, there's going to be a certain percentage of them that are aggressive and can thrive in that environment if they don't get eaten first. But if we take that same batch and put them in this environment, the same percentage is going to have a shot at being aggressive and fitting into that environment because they, they, they adjust to that environment, but it'll be a different batch of fish out of that cohort section. So if you've got, uh, say, 100,000 babies, there's a, only a maybe 20, 25% of them that are going to have the chance to survive over the first six weeks. And then those that survive, if they don't get eaten by the other adults, you can see where this is going. The numbers plummet. So what's going on is, is reproduction is how many fish can be spawned at that spawning point. Recruitment and how many of them are fortunate to not get eaten and come into the population. So now, if you think about it, look at it like this way. Recruitment is like, my, I've got a grandson that's a uh, junior in high school. He plays on a state championship contending football team at Gunner, Texas. And that kid starts. Well, last year he was on the junior varsity as a sophomore. The year before that he was on the freshman team. So in your pond, if, you've, if, 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 if it's recruiting as it should, and I'll cover that here in a minute. Great question, by the way. I love that. I love that. So when... when you know, that, that fifth, sixth grade teams come up into middle school, then they play seventh and eighth and then ninth grade. How many of those kids in the ninth grade are actually going to be on the varsity their senior year? 
Not all of them. But if you don't have that ninth grade team coming up the pipe, what are you going to have when that class is seniors? If you if they none of them make it, then you're not recruiting to the varsity. So the same thing happens underwater. You've got fish that are being hatched, that are growing, that can survive in that environment, in that water, with that habitat. And those are the fish that are going to recruit. Now, recruitment is not just based on how well they reproduce. Recruitment is going to be based on how well they can survive. That's why you have a harvest plan. Because when, they, when some fish graduate in your pond and you don't take them out, they're still wearing their, wearing their letter jacket when they're 30 years old. And we don't want that. You know, so that's why we talk about a harvest plan. Because when you harvest your pond properly, you're making room to recruit younger fish that have the same potential or better potential to get bigger than the ones that you're culling. In which most of the time, the, the size classes we're culling with largemouth bass, for example, are 10 to 14 inch fish that we weigh and measure and that we see are underweight. They don't know how to block. They can't tackle. They can't pass. They can't catch. They're out. They're not going to make it. They just can't, they can't compete at that. You know, so when you're looking at your fish and you're judging which ones to harvest, you know, one of the things I used to think about 25 years ago was, okay, well, now what do I tell people when they, when they catch enough fish out of that slot? If I'm telling people to catch fish out of that 10 to 14 inch slot, what do I do when they empty the slot? Doesn't happen. I didn't know that, you know, 25, 30 years ago, whatever it was. But as I kept studying these fisheries and seeing what would happen, when you call that slot, the best of the best behind them grow into that slot. So it's a never-ending process with the, with the pond. You're going to be culling fish, or what's going to happen is they're going to reach a plateau. You're going to have a, a size class of fish, or two size classes of fish, that are going to stop. They're, they're going to run out of food, stop growing, and begin to decline and lose weight. When that happens, your recruitment goes to zero. Absolutely zero. So when that happens, then you got a stalemate. So you got all these dadgum 30-year-olds wearing their letter jackets out there around the football field trying to get a little bit of love, you know, and they don't have anything to eat. And they couldn't block and tackle at that age if they wanted to, even at the high school level. So you got to take them out. Uh, and that's, that's the difference between reproduction and recruitment. Great question. I've, I don't think I've ever talked about that on this show. Good stuff. Let's see here. Jeff Thompson, do you feel that pea gravel is necessary in a bluegill hatchery ponds? No, I don't think it's necessary, but I think it's great. <laughs> you know, I've seen bluegill spawn in sand. I've seen them spawn in uh, hard pan clay areas. What they need to be able to do is to sweep out an, a, a nest that's not silty. That's what they need. If they can make their beds, I mean, I've seen them make them on a slant. They prefer shallow, uh, uh, flat ground, and they nest in colonies. If they find, those bluegill find one spot that's, as big as this porch that you can't see, they'll make 150 beds right there. And they're all about as big around as the cattle hoof print. Now, they need hard substrate for that. They can't do it in silt because if they did, the silt would collapse and the eggs would die. You know, so that doesn't work. So do I think pea gravel is, um, let's see here. Do I think it's necessary? No, but I think it's important if you want longevity from your spawning beds. Doug Cusick, I signed up last Wednesday for your magazine. I have not heard from anyone yet. I'm sure it's in process. Yes, if you signed up last Wednesday, then the first issue you're going to get will be the November-December issue, unless Leanne sent one in the mail, which typically we add you to the subscription list, and you, you get the next one coming up to bat, and that'll be the November-December issue. And it's at the printer. We're early with it. Uh, when, when I heard the news reports of the Dadgum Postal Service, Slowing down their service. I, I don't I don't quite get that. Let's see. They're gonna raise their prices and slow the service down. Yeah. That makes sense. So all that means to a guy like me that depends on the postal service and their incompetence is we need to get done early. So we're, I'm hoping that the magazines start hitting mailboxes by the first of November, uh, because they're they're at the printer right now and they should be in the mail in the mail stream next week. So that gives them three weeks to take our bulk mail and stuff it in your mailbox, which I hope that happens. Hello, Vito. Good to see you, buddy. Let's see here. Okay, Mike McPherson, I measured two bass at 13 and a quarter and the largest bluegill over nine and a half. That is spectacular. That is more than what you should expect. That's For, for that time span, from the springtime to now, 
that's really good. It's not unheard of. Actually, I've seen myself, I've seen some bass go from two inch fingerlings to two and a quarter pounds, you know, when they were stocked in, in mid May and checking them in late November. Now, of course, that's just the best of the best. They don't average that at all. They're going to average 10 and 11 inches, maybe 12 inches. But if you've got some that are 13 and a quarter, you're ahead of the curve. That's good. Actually, what's really interesting about that is those bass will begin reproducing next spring. So there's upsides and downsides, you know, and, and I'm not opposed to them spawning, but it does kind of start throwing a hickey in your harvest plans. So that's, that's, that's a good reason right there for you to be checking out the, uh, uh, links and weights seven o'clock already. Let's take a minute. Palm Mall's magazine, 35 bucks a year, cheaper than a Friday night date. And I will get in trouble if I don't say this because Chris blood tells me all the time, uh, he said, Bob, you need to promote your Institute of Hyperpondology. So I'm going to do that. We've got, uh, and actually Chico's working on some more videos to add to that curriculum. We've got one of the best curricula I've ever seen, probably the best one online for pond management for the price. Now, I know you can find all kinds of information for free. I get that. But do you believe it? it does it make sense? How do you know what's true? Um, you know, uh, I read somewhere on the Internet that Abraham Lincoln had a quote. Abraham Lincoln said, don't believe everything you read on the Internet. Huh. That didn't have to soak into my brain long to figure it out. So what we've tried to do is put together some outstanding um, educational videos and entertaining videos they can help you be a better pond meister. And you can find those. It's teachable.pondboss.com. Or you can go to the Pond Boss website and look for the inter, uh, Institute. It's the Institute of Higher Pondology. Um, and I also want to thank Texas Hunter. Chris Blood works for Texas Hunter. I want to thank Texas Hunter for helping sponsor this show. If it wasn't for guys like Chris Blood and Dale Baden and the guys over there at Texas Hunter, it would be hard to do this. Although it's fun. You know, I really do like it. Keeps my brain sharp. Um, plus I love helping people. And I love getting your questions, but Texas Hunter, not only do I love their products, now they're high end, you know, they're not cheap. But they're worth it. They're worth it because 10 years later, you're going to have a fish feeder that still works. Now that doesn't mean you won't have to buy a battery from time to time or, or if the fire ants chew the wires off the, off the, you know, the timer, then you got to get another timer, but they're highly responsive. One of my favorite things is, is I can place an order. And it goes out that day if I place it before 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So that's pretty darn cool. So uh, um, the other one, I, Purina Mills, um, I was talking to some of those guys today. They're, uh, I, I, I love their approach to creating products. And they have great fish food. So if you want to grow big fish fast, be, be, be doing that. Be using those feeds, especially the MVP. And Kenny Sanderson will be the first one to tell you that sometimes they have some hiccups on trying to get it distributed through their dealers. You know, where the dealers want to blame the production and or blame the company, and the company says, no, the dealer didn't order it right, or the salesperson didn't handle it, whatever. But every Purina dealer should be able to get every product. You know, now they might not be able to have it in the store that day. It might take a week to get it, but the products are outstanding. I don't think we can argue that point with anybody. Let's see here. What else we got here? Oh, oh, I need to say thank you to to uh, David Schneiderman, Easy Docs. Easy Docs of Texas. Check him out. He watches this show almost every Wednesday. Let's see here. Devin Thompson is replying to uh, Jeff. It's not, but if you're going to be, but if you're going to be worth it, okay, uh, if you're going to go to the effort, it's going to be worth it. Yeah, you know that $400 load of pea gravel for that, $75,000 pond that you're building, it's like the bow on the package. So I, I would, I would, I would still, even though it, it costs and the question, I hit the question, I answered it right. I would still look at buying pea gravel. Now there's a difference here. It, it's very common for somebody to say, well, I can't find pea gravel. Will crushed rock work? Crushed rock is not nearly as good. It's abrasive. When those fish start trying to move that rock and create that crater, if, if there's sharp edges on that rock, those fish can get cut. And I've seen that happen, and I've seen them die from it. They don't really they don't die from the uh, initial cut. They die from the infection that they get after that. You know, because they stay in it. They don't go out and feed. They don't go out and heal. You know, they're continually running around in that gravel protecting that nest. So I would rather see sand than crushed rock, but I would rather see pea gravel than sand. So that's the way I see it. Jason Rutledge. 
Is there any negative effect in not stocking after digging a pond for a year or longer? The pond is, is full and has been. Gambusi are the only thing that occupies the pond right now. Vegetation is taken off and the water is gorgeous. It's ready, just waiting on the supplier. Jason, the negative effect of waiting to stock a pond is where the gambusi has come from. And how do you know that's the only fish in there? You know, if you get a few fish from the same watershed that the mosquito fish came from, you get a few sunfish, maybe a few bass, they're going to want to go in and say, holy cow, we got a great environment, we're going to take it over. And they will. You know, so waiting a year to stock is is not, I think, the best plan. It Now, the upside is if you know there's no fish in there, then that pond can develop for a year. And I don't ever recommend waiting a year, but if that's the case, as long as it develops in a healthy way with good clean water and good vegetation, habitat's adequate, then wait a year. But it, my experience has shown most ponds that are built in a watershed end up with fish. I was talking to a, a, a guy that built a lake and he had a pond upstream in the watershed on his property. He chose not to kill the fish in it. Well, we stocked bluegill, fathead minnows, and red ear sunfish in the spring. And he sent me a picture yesterday of a 12-inch bass. We haven't put bass in it yet. Where'd that come from? So that's going to change our complete stocking strategy. Now, we're instead of stocking fingerling bass, we're going to stock fewer numbers and fish that are 6 to 8 inches that are feed trained. And then ask him to juice up his feeders and see if he can't get those fish to eat that fish food and catch up with those fish that escaped into the lake. Now, there may not be very many, and the upside of that is stocked bass can catch up with them. But the bad part is if they don't catch up with them and pass them, those fish are going to reproduce next year. So then the life cycle gets kicked in, not exactly in the way that we had planned. So there we go. That's the answer to that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scoot back up and see if I've missed anything here. Said hello to Vito in Whitesboro. I'm going to circle through Whitesboro sometime Tuesday. So good to see Ken, Katmandu. Good to see Ken. He's a, uh, a moderator on the Palm Boss Forum. Uh, he's not as active as he used to be because he's pretty well retired, but we love us some Ken. Let's see what else we got here. Jeff Wallen. Hi, boss. My pond has been every shade of blue-green this year. Never clear. Fish are growing so not a problem. Do hybrid bluegill reproduce? Hybrid bluegill will reproduce. Now, the here's the catch-22. When you buy true hybrid bluegills, if they're hybrid bluegills crossed with green sunfish, the F1, they they nicknamed it the Georgia Giant by, from a hatchery over in Georgia. Boy, that didn't sound good. Sound like a wreck. If I hear sirens in a minute, we'll know. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, hybrid bluegills the females have viable eggs but they typically don't reproduce with each other 95 percent of them are males five percent are females those females have eggs they can reproduce you know so even though they're true hybrids they still have the capability of reproducing same thing with uh, bluegill red ear crosses now they'll and and they still like to nest as though they're parents you know the bluegills they like to spawn several times during warm months, you know, in like in Texas, bluegill will spawn five times. Missouri, two or three. You know, Nebraska, two or three. South Dakota, once, maybe twice. Upstate New York, once, maybe two times, if they're nourished well. You know, and so even these hybrids still have the same spawning instincts of their parents. It's just that they can't spawn nearly as much, but they still will. James Allen from Kentucky. Any thoughts about the use and effectiveness of barley bales for algae management? I've done that. Uh, hello, Chance Birch. Good to see you, buddy. Um, yes, barley bales work pretty well to break down algae and help prevent it from growing. The catch-22 is after, after the barley's done its job, now you've got a big bale of, of straw decaying in the water. So it can affect water quality depending on how much you use. So again, once again, it's a balancing act. You need to use enough of it that it does the job, but not so much that it creates a different problem. It's an organic way to do it. It's not on any approved EPA list, you know, but it's kind of a um, an organic way that people people do it. 
Now, you're not going to get in trouble if you do it, but just keep in mind that when you put it out there and it does its job, then it's going to break down and add nutrients to the pond. So you may be trading problems, which, I don't know, that might not be a bad deal. Let's see, what else we got here? Mark Hicks. Let me see here. Can't get, oh, there it is. I live in central North Kakalak, where stocked trout cannot survive in the warm water during warmer months. Is there any negative effects on stocking trout in my bass pond during the cooler months? No negative effects at all. Actually, that's a common practice. And in North Carolina, they're really affordable. You know, you can buy trout for not much money. Now, you basically are going to have two goals when you stock trout. Uh, goal one is to have some catchable fish in the wintertime. You know, in, in, in my experience here in Texas and in North Carolina, it's going to be probably pretty similar because you're along the Atlantic seaboard. Your climate's fairly similar. Is we can typically start stocking those when water temperature gets down in the low 60s. Uh, if, I, I think we wait until the water's like 62 or 63 going down. Well, in, in Texas, in North Texas, that happens in uh, about the fourth week of November, first week of December. So when the water temperature hits that cool time, we stock them. Now, the second reason to stock them is to feed your bass. Now, if you're going to do that, you need to pick out which size bass you want to feed and buy the trout that fit in that bass's mouth. Uh, i got a longtime friend from Oklahoma City that for about 15 years, he stocked 8 to 10 inch rainbow trout every winter. He had the budget, he had the want to, and he did it. And his primary goal, he didn't care if he could if he caught a trout because he could go to Colorado and go trout fishing anytime he wanted to. But he stocked them to take his five-pound bass, six-pound bass, up to seven pounds, eight pounds, with the hope of growing double digits, which he did. You know, around Oklahoma City, that's a pretty good accomplishment to get bass up above 10 pounds. And he did it primarily with stocking trout and then focusing on his bluegill. You know, so... They live from, oh, like in North Texas and probably in your part of North Carolina from the first week of December until about Memorial Day weekend. Now, when the water temperature gets up into the mid-60s, like 66, 67, 68, the trout get sluggish. And by that time, bass are, are there starting to really ramp up and go and eat heartily. So what happens is as the trout get sluggish, the bass gorge themselves on them and then when the water temperature, when it, when it hits in the mid-60s, they're not as easy to catch. So your catch rates drop. And we've had them live until right after Memorial Day here, well, in Texas. And I, would, I have no thought or no reason to think they wouldn't do that in North Carolina as well. I just want a winter fishery and it doesn't matter if they don't. Yeah, okay, that's great. Yeah, do it. Sure. I don't, I don't see anything wrong with it. You have some great trout hatcheries up in western north carolina so you bet go all over it go all over it let me make sure i've not missed any questions i think i've got everybody so far i was thinking about telling some stories you know some aha moments things like that um let me think about it a minute you know, going going back to the question about reproduction versus recruitment I've had a, quite a few aha moments about that topic. And the thing to remember about recruitment is, is you don't want to keep your ninth graders on the ninth grade team for three years. You want the ninth grade to graduate to the 10th, the 10th grade to the 11th, the 11th to the 12th. And the way that you do that is you're paying attention to that fishery to make sure that they're gaining weight. You know, a, a I've said this before on the show, a, a 14 ounce, ba a 14 inch bass should weigh one pound, seven ounces. If your 14 inch bass weigh one pound, one ounce, it lost weight. It couldn't get to 14 unless it weighed one seven. So learn the standard weights of the different species of fish that you're interested in. And something else that's important is understand their lifespan. You know, some of these fish like a bluegill, a bluegill in North Carolina is going to live six to eight years. Same thing in Texas. In Nebraska, it might live seven to nine because when the water temperature cools off, these fish have so many heartbeats. Look at it like that. When they're cold-blooded, so when the water temperature gets cool, their heart slows down, their metabolism rate slows down, they slow down. You know, now, uh, when you think about that, then the lifespan of those fish in northern tier states might be a little bit longer. I remember seeing a, uh, a report of a largemouth bass 
in northern Illinois outside of Chicago that they documented that made it 22 years. That had to be a northern fish. It was tagged in like its second year, and somebody caught it 20 years later and uh, turned in the tag, length and weight. That fish hadn't gained weight probably in 15 years because it topped out as big as it's going to get. And the size that it got was based on how long it stayed a youth. If Shaquille O'Neal did not eat well in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th grade, he wouldn't have been 14 feet tall. Same with your fish. So the fish that have the genetic propensity for size, if they're deprived of their food chain when they're young, then their top-end growth is not going to be that big. Plus, the fish in, around Chicago is a northern fish, and they usually top out at 8 pounds at the very very best. But the fact that that fish lived 22 years is is a long, long time for any fish to live. Now, channel cat, on the other hand, they can live to be 18, 19, 20 years. Largemouth bass, Florida strain, typically 10 to 13 years. Uh, northern largemouth bass in Midwestern states headed to the south, they might live 8 to 12 years, maybe 10 years. Bluegill, 6 to 8. Fathead minnows, 18 months to 2 years. Threadfin shad, 18 months. Gizzard shad, 4 years. You know, so as you're looking around, thinking about what your surroundings are with your pond, think about the uh, uh, longevity and think about how you're going to support what you've got to support. You know, how long does a pine tree last? Well, I don't know. Depends on if it burns down or if it's properly taken care of. It's got water. You know, so your fish are going to have limiting factors as well. And as long as you understand those limiting factors and you can stop that, like the food chain, you know, happy water, um, the right kind of genetics. And when you pull all those pieces together, proper harvest, then you're going to have fish that can live their lifespan and maximize and do the best they can do and grow really, really well. Um, the, another part of the, another story I wanted to tell you, hello, Chuck Brinkman. Good to see you. Um, one thing I wanted to tell you, let's see, here comes one from Mark Dyer. looks like. What plants will be most beneficial to place on a floating island when you use one of those foam floating pads? Let me see here if I can get that on my computer. Kids play and would like to make a floating island. Um, you know, you can use pretty much any bog plant. Now, most plant. anytime I, I've used Floating Islands International Floating Islands. I like those because I like the matrix of the mesh. And I, I put sterile topsoil on it. Sterile meaning no seeds, uh, no, um, no roots, nothing like that. So I'm not dealing with plants that I don't want. Although that's going to happen. Willow trees are going to grow. Cattails are going to grow, etc. But But you can grow pretty much any plant you want. And I've planted everything from... Uh, Louisiana iris to uh, arrowhead to mint to St. Augustine grass. You can pretty much plant what you want. Now, in these floating mats, you're going to very likely need to cut some holes in them and then take a potted plant and take the, take the soil and the plant and stick them down in that hole. And when you do that, then the roots are going to go down into the water and they're going to they're thrive. So I think I would lean more toward bog plants to answer that question. Um, going back to the topic, you know, when you, when you start thinking about that environment underneath the water, then the next thing to do is look at what's going on at the water line. Because what you're going to see when, the, 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 when you build a pond, the minute that that bulldozer pushes its first silver blade full of dirt, you've changed that ecology and that environment for at least five generations past you. So it's incumbent on you understand those consequences and then you know five generations from now what are they going to say about it whoa i can't believe this pond is still this great you know here 100 years later you know did you prevent silt from coming in did you make sure that you had the right kind of permanent habitat did you make sure that the water was good healthy water coming in from the watershed in other words like the the guy in northeastern missouri i'm talking to he bought like 50 acres surrounded by cornfields. His water's coming off of a cornfield, no matter what. So part of his job is to create a buffer zone as far up in the watershed as he can go to the corn 
that creates a natural filtration system. Plus, he's building a small silt pond with a drain in it where he can get water out of it. You see that shadow? That's a fly going over the camera. <laughs> um, and so uh, uh, part of his mission on building that pond is what do I do to prevent siltation? So he, that's in his radar and he's, he's, he's doing it, you know? And so when you, when you, when you think about those things, then look, look about what's going on right at the water line. So you've created this new environment that's going to be there five generations from now. And then you've got the water line to look at. You're going to see different plants begin to grow there. You're going to see cattails. You're going to see, uh, you plant Louisiana irises. You'll start to see, um, creeping yellow water primrose, things like that that are growing right there on the edge. Then you go up about four or five feet. It's different. It's a different kind of plant. That's when you start seeing your oak trees or your, you know, cypress trees, water level up to about three feet above water. So study those things. And when, when, when that stuff starts to grow, it's a brand new habitat for brand new creatures that are going to come and get it. One thing to remember, here's, this is really, really important. What grows in your pond is a consequence of the decisions that you've made to set the stage for that consequence. So if you've built the right kind of habitat, you've built the right, you have the right kind of water, you got the right kind of soils, you got the right kind of fish, they're going to thrive in it. But if you don't, they're not. Something else is going to happen that you may not like, like the stunted bass deal. The same thing is going to happen right there at the edge of the water. If you're mowing right down to the edge of the pond, you're not going to have very many snakes coming up very often except during the rut. Now, believe it or not, snakes go into a rut. And when they do, they move. You'll find them on your front porch. <laughs> I got a story I'll share one time. You know, I might do that right now. Let me see what questions we got here. Mark Dyer, what kind of plants you pick? You pick. Uh, just make sure they're good aquaponic type plants. But I'd look mostly at bog plants. Chance Birch, is there ever a time to remove the grass carp, year, size, or just leave them till they die off and restock? Well, they're hard to get out. You know, that's why I, one of the things I preach out is, is, is don't overstock triploid grass carp. And what does that mean? You know, people start looking at grass carp when they start having a problem with plants. And when it becomes a problem, they don't think about that problem took three years to get that bad. And they want to clean it up now, so they'll overstock grass carp. When you do that, they're going to eat it all, and then they're going to try grazing wherever they can get it. I mean, I've, I've actually literally watched grass carp come up out of the water three or four inches grabbing willow leaves from a willow tree hanging down in the water. You know, and so how long do they live? 10 to 15 years, depending on where you are. So what I tell folks is if you've got an aquatic plant problem, Look at three or four different ways to deal with it. You may need to deal with it with aquatic herbicides and with grass carp to do uh, more cleanup rather than eradication. So how, how do you get rid of them? Not an easy way to do it because they're so skittish and it's hard to catch them. If, if, if you catch, if you stocked, I had a guy email me and he had stocked five grass carp eight years ago. And they had, they now he has no plants in a small pond. And so he said, well, I've caught two and it's taken me three years to catch those two. <laughs> is there a better way? Well, one way is, is set the feeder off and they get used to it. Then you can shoot one with a bow and arrow. Now, when you do that, everything's going to run off. They're not going to come back to that feed for four or five days, and it's including the grass carp. You know, so that's just kind of the way that works. Um, James Allen, the water primrose took off this year, grew 10 to 15 feet from the shore. What's the best way to control it? I've always used glyphosate on, on – uh, water primrose but now it's too late now it's going dormant and if you're going to treat it with a herbicide you guys go to aquaplant.tamu.edu just look up aquaplant online that is a great website that can show you your choices now if you can positively identify the plant <coughs> then you can look at your different uh options on what to do about it The reason I'm saying not to do anything about it now is because most of the time when you use a herbicide on a plant, the plant's got to take it up, translocate to the roots, and kill it at the roots. You know, but when that plant stops thriving and growing, getting ready to go dormant, it's not translocating much to the roots. It's preparing to go into the winter. Our photo period, days are getting shorter. 
Temperatures are beginning to drop. That's nature's signal to plants that, hey, you've done your job for the year. That's time to rest. So it's, it's really hard this time of year to take them out. So watch it as it comes out next spring. Spend some time on Aquaplant. Look at your options and choose the ones that you think is better. Let's see. How close to the pond should we allow trees to grow? Um, you can let them grow right up to the edge. Now, keep them off the dam. We don't want trees growing on dams. Uh, when It's common that we'll, I'll get a call from somebody who just bought a piece of property that's got a lake on it, and the dam is covered up in trees. Well, they'll say, how many of these trees should I take? And my standard rule of thumb, and Mike Cotto agrees with this, is if they're four inches in diameter or smaller, cut them down. But if you cut down a 10-inch oak tree on the front side slope of a dam, it's got a root ball that's almost as big as a Volkswagen you know, and that when that root ball rots, it leaves a void, which can compromise the dam. But on the edge of the pond or lake, grow as many trees as you want. You know, just watch out for beavers because they're going to want to come cut them down depending on where you live. So, yeah, you can get as close as you want to. Chris Blood. I was hoping Chris would pop in. Hey, Bob, beautiful view. Yeah, man, I'm on the side of a mountain in Rio Doso, New Mexico. It's really nice out here. It's, uh, I'm going to go play tourist tomorrow afternoon and Friday and then uh, hunker down and do some more work. Go, I'm going to go see my grandson. I have a grandson, believe it or not, that's in the Air Force. He's a remote sensor operator and based in Clovis, New Mexico. He's got the coolest job. He, uh, When he was in the eighth grade, he knew he was going to go into the Air Force when he graduated. He knew the job he wanted. And when the recruiters tried to divert him to something else they'd rather have, he said, no, I won't, I'll, I won't do it. I'm going to wait for that job. And his, his fate had it, and as God intervened, he got that job. So he's a remote sensor operator on drones, and it's pretty cool because he um, he's the guy that helps to do surveillance. He operates the camera. There's a pilot that flies the drone, and he operates the camera systems and can help activate the weapon systems if they need it. So mostly they do surveillance, looking for the bad guys, and they do it right there from their from their base. It's pretty, pretty dead gum cool. Uh, but... Chris, how do people find me? If if what I tell you where I'm I'm kind of going now. My direction in the last couple of years has evolved to where I'm helping people design new fishing lakes, and that's actually how I'm making my living right now. Is uh, is helping people design lakes. I see Sean Peters checking in. Good to see him. Um, so I, I to get me, you just send an email to info at pomboss dot com. I also think part of my calling, I see Mark Dyer, I can see Mark. Um, part of my calling is to help folks be better stewards of their land and water. So that's part of my that's part of my giving back after doing this for 41 years. So it's exciting to me to be able to spend time and talk about these things and answer your questions. Uh, but I do have to make a living, you know. And so part of the way I do that, a big part of the way now is uh, I've got lake projects going on, helping people design lakes in Iowa. I got uh, three in Missouri. I've got four in Oklahoma, and I think five in Texas, and they're all in different phases from planning. And I, I, the number one deal about that is making the right kind of plan. If you plan things out, then you're going to have a much much better chance of getting the end result that you want in a budget you can live with. That's a big deal. So we're almost at an hour. Hey, remember, remember the deal here. Uh, hashtag Pond Balls Magazine. Share this with your friends. Put it on your timeline. You're eligible for a drawing for a Pond Balls mug that knows how to keep hot things hot and cold things cold and a Pond Balls hat. And Pond Balls Magazine, 35 bucks a year. Cheaper than a Friday night date. Last a year. So I'm going to kind of check out of here and see. Let me make sure. Let's see here. Uh, Travis, I'll, I will see him Saturday. We're going to meet halfway. He's in Clovis. I'm in... in uh, uh, Rodoso, so we're going to go to Roswell, find us a place to get lunch and watch college football and catch up. He's 22 years old, my oldest grandchild. So can't wait to hang out with him. All right, so guys, I'm going to wrap it up and tell you thank you for watching this show. I deeply appreciate it. <coughs> I don't know where I'll be next Wednesday. I think I'll probably be in Whitesboro at my office. But wherever I am, we will go do this again. So until then, thanks again for watching, and uh, until next week, adios.